Hello, I'm John Coleman from Apocus de Stasis, an institute for the humanities, an alternative college and high school here on New Milford, Connecticut, USA. Today I'm being joined by Dr. R. Mikhail Fisher, all the way from Western Canada. How are you doing, Michael? I'm good. I'm good. I love how you always have so many different pronunciations of my name. Mikael, Mikael, <laughs> Michael. Yes. Any of Absolutely. those are okay just to let people know, but Mikael is how I usually say it. Like good. I'll like add that to number four there. Very good. Very good. Good to have you. And good to have you, audience, as well. Before we dive into this discussion on pedagogy, on praxis, on the rebel, on the normie as archetypes and as realities that we must deal with in life, uh, just one announcement concerning our dear institute as we plow into the autumn 2024 20, semester. I can't believe it's uh, 24 already and long in the tooth at that. But the announcement is indeed to go and check out Dr. Fisher's Ferology Center at the Institute and the various uh, interviews he's done, his writings, and you can be ferried over to his proper site. Uh, and get much more in his regular blog and so forth. I mean, this really is cutting edge uh, research on fear and the dynamics in society and the individual. And it's such an honor to have the Furology Center and to have his insights and his guests available uh, to the Institute community. So check that out. And indeed, uh, Dr. Fisher, welcome and tell us a bit about yourself for people who may be coming across you and, and your work for the yeah. first time. Sure. So first of all, I guess just to my legacy has been to go through a few different careers and that was ecology and environmental biology. So I was an environmentalist basically for the long part of my early 20s, then got into rehabilitation studies, um, got involved with then education in the late and early 80s and uh, got my degree and became a school teacher for a couple of years in the normal system and dropped out after a couple of years. And so then I went as an entrepreneur since 1983. So it was the last time I ever collected a regular paycheck, 1983. And I walked out of the system. And so, you know, 40, basically 41 years of uh, figuring out how to make it in this world and be true to myself, but also working with those systems. So I, you know, I advertised myself as an educational consultant for many years uh, and then eventually became very interested in organizations and leadership uh, as well in my studies. But the topic of fear and fearlessness since 1989, uh, I call myself a fearologist now. It started as a joke and then became more serious. Oh, maybe there's actually something to this. Um, and so I, I'll talk today about uh, basically my legacy within alternative education. Uh, because as you can hear, I, le I left it when I was basically 31 years old. I left the system. I left, you know, basically getting a, a regular paycheck. And then I had to figure out how to be an artist, how to be a creative entrepreneur and work in the this kind of diaspora of constant improvisation. And that, I think, is really exciting for a way to live and make a living. I've done it. I've had children. I've had family. I've, you know, had my own little businesses. I've worked in centers within centers. And right now I'm in the center of Apocosis Institute with this other center. This is not new for me. It's actually a long uh, trajectory of being in centers within centers. And there's a reason for that, right? Because every center, every institute needs some kind of radical centers that are outliers, that are satellites, that, that don't tow just the total line of what the institute's doing. And I know you try to do that at the Apocalypse since to you bring in these different centers, which I think is just a great idea. So it just seemed a natural fit that you and I would connect. So we've been, you and I, in communication for two years almost. Yes, and, and a very good back and forth and, and productive cooperation it's been. And I love that expression that you have, this diaspora of improvisation. And, and what, a, what a, great, uh, a great snippet for those of us in this, this world, whether that's the arts or pedagogy, you're just living, in a sense, on the margins yeah. of society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, those phrases are, are a little bit of a takeoff on Alain Gurdjieff, the educational philosopher from, from Israel, um, now late died in 2016 or so somewhere in oh. there and uh i did a talk with ari gazelle and i know you've uh, linked that up on the site uh, as well and you enjoyed that talk with ari 
a professor of education within the mainstream in Haifa University. And he, he's got like one of the most radical philosophers in out of Israel in the contemporary era, mm. uh, Alain Gurdjieff. And Gurdjieff uses this idea, it's, it's better to be a diasporic citizen rather than constantly trying to find the home and then defend it and then mm. try to fight and create enemies around your home. He says, let let the Jews, he's a Jew, you know, let the Jews be free, let them be diasporic. Mm. And they are some of the most brilliant, we know that, more Nobel Prizes and high prizes than any other ethnic group. And and he, what he calls eternal uh, innovation. Mm. That's what goes with being in the diaspora. You're constantly adapting, shifting. And that's such an interesting contrast, isn't it, to the search for the static, stable mm. home that keeps it. But he still has a theory of you can build sacred sanctuaries. Mm. But that's a land Gertiev. It's not what to talk about is today. But just to tell you, he and he came up with the concept of counter education. Mm. That was what he promoted for years. And very few educators know about that work. I would love homeschoolers. I would love all the whole alt con community to read uh, Alain Gurdjieff stuff. It's a bit tough and hard, but you know, through people like myself or yourself, uh, we can interpret and uh, interpret some of that work. But it's it does lay out a very different way to be in the world. And basically, the idea of global citizen, which I think Apocalypsis would support in general, that doesn't mean you can't have your ethnic group that you identify with, your other identities that you like to identify with. But it's also saying let's not get caught and stuck in the retro loop. Mm -hmm. And I'll be talking about the retro loop today uh, as part of my theorizing about the rebel. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And yes, I mean, th this idea of the global citizen, maybe that that concept is is of newer coinage, but it goes back. Uh, what we're doing exactly to, to Dr. Fisher's point is it goes back to the Renaissance, the idea of the Republic of Letters and mm -hmm. it's 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 quite old indeed. And it's okay. grand to be carrying on that tradition. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I think about this idea, indeed, the, the diaspora of innovation that, that you mentioned, and we're talking for the audience's benefit, so you know where we're going. Um, this this chit-chat here is kind of an ongoing, uh, sometimes public, sometimes private discussion between uh, Dr. Fisher and myself and some of the other staff about what does Apocalypse Stacy's Institute mean and stand for, and trying to be, in the past few months, more clear um, about about philosophy, and and I I very much welcome this um, this uh, bull session uh, in that in that um, ongoing conversation. But speaking about being creative in, in this diaspora, um, I I think about you know what what if I had stayed in the mainstream schools? I actually have never been in a mainstream school properly speaking. But what if I had gone in that route? Or, or even just stayed, you know, more in the in the pub, uh, private schools, and um, for whatever uh, whatever trials and tribulations that have come with Apocalypses these ten years, I've learned a tremendous. Just personally speaking about learning in schools, just I've learned, you know, stuff I would never have learned uh, in terms of time zones and scheduling and topics on interviews and um, yeah. it, it's it it the circumstances as cruddy as they are in the field of education, in my opinion, the circumstances really do draw out the best uh, in us if we're willing to embrace the the work at hand. Yeah, and the work in the edges. And when you have, you know, if we're marginal or edges, that's not a put down. That's not a bad place to be. That's kind of the point, right? It's like so many people, and I understand why people would feel victimized in the margins. Mm -hmm. you're, yes. you're going up against the, the behemoth. Uh, and it always feels like a David and Goliath kind of affair, doesn't it, at some level? And at one level, that's probably has true. And there's no doubt um, that great bee moth will attempt to, you know, incorporate, appropriate, or just eliminate, not feed you, cut off supplies. I've gone through all this, you know, I'm 70 years old now, so 72. And so I've been on this track of, for 50 years of entering the alternative. Mm. And I want to basically say, it's, it's not all bad and it's not all oppressive and horrible. I used to think that way and I used to be really rank, ranting all the time like John. <laughs> but he's okay. He's young. He can do that. 
Um, <laughs> and it's all needed. Uh, you know, that's my view. I, I get, I, I have a nice long spectrum to, 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 to think about uh, alter, alternative education and homeschooling and stuff. So that's kind of what I want to track out a little bit so people get to know me a bit. And it's kind of a way to get me to know and you to know me and the faculty. Um, I'd like us all to talk out, you know, what is our relationship to the alternative, to the margins, to the diasporic uh, survival, you know, and it's not just survival, it's a thrival. And I think that's what you're Ooh. saying, right? You're saying I've more than survived, you know, and I would say that too. It's like, it, it really can push you to grow and change and develop um, a lot more than the often in the, the main and in the normal, because the normal is based on maintenance and, Ooh reification right of itself and at one level you kind of go well i like it what you say they're public school they admit it mm. that's yes, the norm yes. that's their norm and and they're just reifying and their people pay taxes for them so if people didn't pay taxes for them they wouldn't be there so it's like you can't blame anybody it's like there's no one to blame because it's being supported at the same time and then you can say well are the people just stupid and they're all hypnotized well, that's not a very kind thing to say about people. Um, I'm not saying there isn't those components of all of us maybe not thinking as brilliantly as we could. And in certainly cir circumstances, some of us are kind of dumbed down for the, even through that system. But that doesn't mean people are not stupid. So you get leaders like Cornell West, Marion Williamson in the United States, who I've been following in this mm -hmm. election cycle. And these are what I would up. call... Yeah. In a conversation I had earlier with Jim Fetzer, he had quoted Marianne Williamson as well. And so oh, I thought of you uh, earlier today with that because you have Jim Fetzer, yeah. So please go on. One of your talks. Okay. Yes, sir. Anyways, then just I, I grabbed a couple of titles uh, recently. Cornell West um, running as a third party candidate. Um, talk about a rebel, but. In a way, he's stayed in the mainstream. He's a Princeton, Harvard. He still works in a you know top university now, getting his big paychecks. So he stayed in, but here he is running a third party, right? And speaking his truth to power. He's he's left of the left often, you know, and mm -hmm. he's way out there. Some people think he could be further left, but he he had, this is the title of one of his talks, and it's a quote from him. He says, "The U.S. Empire refuses to grow up." Mm -hmm. wow. End quote. And this is an interesting phrase because this will be kind of a theme for my presentation today about growing up. Mm. Uh, Marion Williamson, one thing she said repeatedly, she ran as a uh, Democrat for the Democrat leadership in the last, you know, two cycles. So literally for six years, I've followed her and her campaign to be this very different kind of a politician leader um, because she's not a regular politician. Neither is Cornell West, but they can run for president uh, if they get the popularity. But she used to say. Who's going to be the grown-ups in the room? This is one of her favorite uh, speech stump, you know, talks. Who's going to be the grown-ups in the room? We've got to be the grown-ups. And she said it's the people who are the spiritual ones, the ones in the higher consciousness community, because that's where she gets her money from. She's an entrepreneur, mm. and she's hung out, and she's a big star in that community, um, you know, seen as a very important spiritual teacher today and an educator. Mm. And she says... We're the last ones who should be sitting out. Uh, mm. because if we sit out, guess who's going to fill our seat in the political leadership spheres? It's not yeah. going to be people you want to fill. Maybe the slugs uh, and the, the, the it, grifters and all this. It's this going lot. to be a lot that you don't want there. But she says the spiritual community, and she's very critical of them. She says they've all opted out. They don't mm. want to run in politics for the most part. And so we've got a bunch of leaders. This is who we got. And so I loved how she's just challenged her, her spiritual, the new age community, the human potential, the wellness communities. And see, those are the alternative communities. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's like, and so I just wanted to throw those out as beginning quotes. And both of them are challenging about growing up. Mm -hmm. Is that not interesting in, in, you know, the 21st century? Any responses to growing up? Who's to say who's to grow up? Who's mm -hmm. to judge? Who's mature? Who's not? But I know I've heard you talk, and I certainly in my own talk, I have not given up on the word maturity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a tremendous deficiency. And there is, from my own reading, the legal system and you know, how the world works or the system of the world, there is a very stern justice to it. Uh, maybe it's not altogether charitable, 
but there is this sense of in the legal system and in the system, the public schools and it plugging into all this and whether or the political stuff, you know, the people who rise to the top, um, if other people bow out, <laughs> there is a reality to life that this is bu bucking up against that you get what you what you want and if you're not willing to put in the time whether that's you know uh, people who put themselves forward as civil leaders as honest uh true leaders of the community yeah. Yeah. um or the the um the system system of education we can grow grope and gripe and 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 complain about it all day long but if if we as a society are not doing anything then we deserve to be treated this way we deserve to get the mediocrity as i would see it that this system dishes out and yeah. there is this idea of, of of assertiveness, speaking of maturity and growing up, that you don't just sit there like an adolescent or a child and, and take what is imposed upon you, but you assert yourself on the situation. Yeah. So let me arc out a little bit of my just kind of autobiographic. Um, that just will help anchor a few points. And then I think things will come out of that as I talk about real true examples of my working in the alternative community. Um, particularly education oriented as the focus for today, but it's a little broader than that. So let mm. me start with, uh, I'm 20 years old. I decided to go and do my first tech diploma, ecological sciences. Uh, so I enter just right after 1970 out of high school. This is the Earth Day beginning. I go in and join the eco activist community, mm. ecological movement, the green movement. And so I was already pumped right into it at 20 years old. Um, nobody told me to do this. I didn't, it's not a legacy in my family. I have a very poor working class family. So nobody's telling me to do activism. They, they don't even think of that, um, my family anyway. And so I just got in there and I was very interested in, you know, educating myself within that field. Um, so I, one of the things I heard around in that community, and this was before I understood politics at all, um, was, earth first hmm. uh, comments like that and i would go oh yeah i'm kind of a little bit like that myself i can't stand humans and what we've done to the planet i was really negative because for good reasons i saw a lot of damage and destruction and the more you read and the more you learn in environmental studies uh, it's a pretty gruesome looking scene ahead hmm. so i'm 20 years old and looking at a pretty gruesome future so that starts me on a trajectory and so this earth first and then I began to realize, oh, these people are kind of like anarchists because they don't want to join the world. They don't want to join even humanity. Mm. Um, Earth first is a kind of statement about not humans first, Earth first. And they are very clear about that. It's still around today as a movement. So I'm not going to talk more about that just to say that was my first raw education with mm. what I would call the edge marginal anarchist quality type and this is not anarchist as bad or any negative it's just it's another form of a way of organizing and making sense rather than the what we call normal quote so-called society then my next uh, venture was uh, joining i just wanted to say i come from a background of religious also extremism um not from my own family my parents my mom was catholic in in europe uh, but when she came over here didn't practice catholicism but I, I certainly saw her fear of Catholicism and she was always afraid of the Catholic church everywhere. I don't know exactly why, but there you go. My dad was come, came from the, the free church, the evangelical free church movement. Mm. Uh, and in, in the province I was here in Canada, they were pretty radical, still are to this day. Uh, and they put out politicians, very right wing, and they are competing in the Canadian, you know, politics all the time. Uh, Jordan Peterson is actually sort of of that ilk. Mm. He, he's not from that particular strain, but he comes out of that region of what we call Bible Belt, uh, Prairie Provinces of Canada. Oh, you have a Bible Belt up there too, huh? Mm -hmm. So they were my cousins. They are my dad's brothers, uh, and there was lots of cousins, and I love them. They're very lovely people. Um, they treated me really well when I was growing up at the farm. They were all farmer, rural, right? Rural, which makes sense with a lot of the strong conservative community. And that's a reality. Mm. 
So I, I learned about how they do education. I learned about they were kind of on their own edge. And I saw they didn't even like the mainstream churches. They thought they were evil. And, and like, never mind, they were also against communism and socialism because they were communism is atheist, right? And so on and so on. So I was hearing all this as a young person, not really understanding it, but I realized it, it actually influenced me a lot. And it influenced me that there are good people in radical movements mm. of all kinds whether i agree with them or not there are good people mm. they do good things now there's lots that i may not like they may not like about me to this day they still say hi to me um but we're not friends we don't hang out together and they're in another province but just the point being i've been in that religious community and i been then i married an ex-nun um so uh <laughs> She was just out of the nuns. She'd been 17 to 31. So I want to say that I became intimately involved in Catholicism from the inside of an <laughs> intimate romantic relationship that produced two children, lovely children to this day who are now in their 40s. Mm. Um, so I've had a lot of experience of watching the interplay of religion. And she also was quite a mystic in herself. Uh, that's the reason I was very interested in her. And mm. she introduced me to lots of parts of life that are not about the scientific realm. Uh, and I went, oh, there's something beyond science? Because I was an eco guy, right? I was a science guy, hard mm. sciences. And so she introduced me to Carl Jung and the unconscious and myth. And okay, okay. So that's where I started to become interested in archetypes. So that will come in mm. when we talk about the rebel. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, yeah. There is this aspect. Um, that marriage, it, that marriage didn't last eight years. I see. I see. There you go. But you got you got the uh, you got the T-shirt, and more importantly, you got the children yeah. and the memories from it. So there you oh, go. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is an interesting dynamic. I think of alternative education. Those of us on these margins in this diaspora, shunned uh, by the mainstream, shunned by our colleagues so often, and that is. Um, the the um, the discipline and the maturity needed to actually affect these ideas and bring them into centers, institutions, as social realities day to day to make sure the lights stay on, to make sure the, the classes, there are people that are staffing them. There's that aspect. And yet there is, you speak of maturity, and yet there there is necessarily uh, in, in this archetype of the rebel and, and so forth, I find there's also this aspect of of the Peter Pan or the the uh, the one who doesn't grow up or the one who doesn't um, move on. I found, just speaking about archetypes, I yeah. came across um, a great treatment of Siddhartha, uh, not the, the figure, but the book by Herman Hesse. And they were talking about how Hesse himself as an author had got, in a sense, stuck at, at 15 or 16 years of age and he never moved on. And I... I found myself very much <laughs> identifying with this yeah. um, this reality, and so uh, all I wanted to say with this is this this strange thing I'm palpitating in our talk together on this topic of the hyper discipline and maturity to actually affect this um, reform of education that is needed, and at yeah. the same time to maintain um, I don't know this arrested development or this ability not just at like to do what most people say. Well, this is the way the world is. Yeah, it's so tricky. And, and to be an improviser, right, a creative, especially being artistic types, etc., or humanities types, um, we, we can easily retain a lot of childlike behaviors. And that's part of we don't want to grow up. If that's what growing up looks like, my mom, my dad, the system, I don't want to grow up. So, so it's actually a really important concept. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we want to grow up? And, and Carl Jung, you know, had the archetype of the pure eternus, eternal youth. Mm. And well, that's a powerful archetype. There's a lot of forces in human history mm -hmm. that are asking us to retain our childness. Look at the teachings of Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. Who are the ones to take over is the little ones, the young ones, the ones who are not filling all the power positions, the anawam, the weak, the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They will be the inheritors of the earth kind of idea. I see that as keeping the eternal youth. And uh, there's not a surprise that Jesus was a very youthful figure up on mm -hmm. the cross being taken down by the old timers. Ah, interesting. You see what I'm saying? And that's the, that's the pure and the cynics. So the Senex is represents the old archetype, of, and then the pure is the youth. And they're in a constant tension, and probably most literature, a lot of literature, a lot of arts is based on that thematic of the old and the new. 
And this is not even about humans. It's Ooh. actually just about how do we develop and from the young, the immature to the old, but not get too old where we don't have renewal. Mm. And in comes apocalypsis and says, we need renewal in the old empire. Mm. You know, it, even in the empire has to renew itself. And sometimes it does that through crashing and burning. Mm. Yes. Right? Yeah. And that's, that's the reformation. That's the restoration of the coming from the ashes, the rise of the phoenix, all mm. those myths. These to me are about development. So this is going to be a key word for me is we're talking about human development. We're talking about organizational and cultural development, evolution, if you wish, to use those words with development. Mm. And yes, history is important, but history is part of development. It's, you know, history, development, those, those kind of go together. They're studies, psychology, study of human development, right? And whatever. Mm. So I am going to always come across as a developmentalist, more or less, unless it's some choicing that I made for various reasons. And one of the reasons is development theories and models give me structure for trying to understand these dynamics of the Oof. old and the new and how they play out. And do, how do you shift from one level of maturity to another level? We call that transformation. We even have a, you know the whole area of studies, transformation studies, and that's trying to understand how do systems regenerate and how do systems mature Oof. and move to higher levels of complexity. You know, so just the very simple language most of us will know is, is you can come into the world with concrete thinking and then you can move to eventually formal thinking and you can move to post-formal thinking. Mm. And there's a lot of studies that show across cultures, across different things that there seems to be something called cognitive development. There's a line of development that is traceable. And then some people try and say, well, that's probably related to how we do morals. And even faith is mm. developmental. You start on very concrete levels. You understand things very literally. And in literature, that's critical analysis in literature. is very important. Are we understanding things only literally? Well, some mm -hmm. people do. They read it. That's it. Mm-hmm. And so you can see there is a development. And again, you can decide how much structure you want to put on that, how much it's universal or not. That can leave that variable, debatable. But I'm interested in those development. And what I would argue is we don't have, that I know of, a good, fairly accessible theory for the development of the rebel. Mm -hmm. And I want to trace that through today after I go through a few more examples with my alt ad. Is that because as a community of critics, we'll say an alternative education and, and yeah. even even certain, you know, eddies in, in the general society, mm -hmm. is that because, Dr. Fisher, you think, um, as I do, that we're, we're so caught up in the critique itself, we have not even, speaking to uh, maturity, we have not even considered uh, a real unified response. I mean, alternative education on the grade level in these United States um, has, has more or less stagnated for 50 years at a kitchen table in these home schools. And you know, in, in tertiary education, I don't think of anything like Apocalypse Stacey's out there. There's a lot of autodidacts out there. There's a lot of schools that are doing, not a lot, but there's some schools that are doing like work studies that are kind of creative, but it's even, you know, it's more rare in, in, in college level so is is that because we're just too caught up in the critique we have not developed this rebel or what are your thoughts uh let's i think i would back it up a little bit um the rebel is developing mm. it is already and it has because i'm just saying it's archetypal mm -hmm. and it's actually part of development of all systems is to go through the failures and the new the new experiments like mm. Organisms do that. No, they don't all come into a population. All the individuals conform. They don't. Mm -hmm. so, and then there's also genetic factors behind why some just don't do the same things. And they, they go back or some are more playful. Some are more serious and want to build things. Um, it, it, there, it's found in all species. Uh, that I'm, a, I'm an evolutionary and ethologist, so I've studied a lot of behavior of social organisms, you know, even ant colonies and so on. There's variation. So this is what the diversity word is supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. But what happens in the alternative community is we do get caught up in the critique. And mm -hmm. that is because we're so interested in being other to the other. Yes. 
<laughs> and when you're other to the other, you're controlled by the other. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're always glaring for it or you're looking for it over your shoulder. Where is it going to show up next? Who's going to say the wrong thing? Oh, you're from the other. I thought you were the free one with us. And so you mm -hmm. get all this infighting, which you <laughs> and I know, and in the alternative community. And it, it just, they collapse on themselves almost certainly. And then what happens is people say, well, it's, it's hard to do communally, so I'm just going to do my own thing. Mm -hmm. And so you get ma massive diversity <laughs> yeah. to the point of they can't coalesce anymore. And developmental theory says, yes, it's good. You have kind of the whole or the conformist, then you split and have some division and diversity. And di but you got to come back and integrate. That's why I like the term you use, integrative education. Mm. We're, see, we're at the cycle of after the big rebellion. Mm. Then you integrate. I think that's your vision. And yes, that's my exactly. vision developmentally. And then mm -hmm. after that, you form a, another whole, then you got to differentiate some more because you're starting to get static again. Mm -hmm. So this is the model. This is, I've just given you a systems model, well known, but it's not well known. And certainly the radical community, I find they throw the baby with the bathwater. Yes. And that's what the downside of this radicalism or the rebel can do. And mm -hmm. that's, it's not always the rebels' fault. It's just mostly it's, they're not informed. They haven't been informed. Um, okay, well, go off and try your own thing. Good luck. <laughs> yes, yes. Rather think... than mentors, right, who can, or people even saying, well, you know, if you do, that's fine. But have you looked at Joseph Campbell's hero model? Have you looked at, and I know you talked about that with one of your guests, and so there are models, and I'm going to give you the Fisher rebel model today. <laughs> Excellent. On. Yes, I think of the uh, historian, his first name escapes me, but Spengler from the late 19th century. Oswald, Spengler. yeah. Yes, Oswald Spengler and his idea of these periods, sometimes of hundreds of years, of fermentation stages of history. Okay, nice. And I think very much uh, we're in that, that whatever we call modernity or p different political nation states, uh, that 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 is running on empty right now. And it may run on empty for another 100, 200 years. Who knows? Yeah. But we're very much in that fermentation stage. And that's why we have things like the Ferology Center and Apocalypse yeah, yeah, exactly. and so forth. Yeah. So again, it would be great for school students in a Apocalypse Institute or in the faculty to just play around with what are all some of the different kinds of models or, that show cycles that you know come from nature as well, come through history, culture, and human development theories of development. And we ought to have our fingertip on those maps. Mm. See, it's not like holding on to them. The map is not the territory. Mm -hmm. but, but what I think you've spoken about and I've heard you say, we don't have a vision in the alt community. Mm -hmm. we're, we're giving up vision for these really pragmatic, practical enactments of, I'm just not going to be that. Mm -hmm. And I go, yeah, but where are you going? Mm -hmm. And that's what I think you say. And then what you find is the standards of the quality of the alt work, not just the educational, but even the social work, the other kinds of work. Yes. In general, in general, there's some obviously more got their act together on quality and advancement of quality production. Your complaint and mine would be is there's no reason for the rebel to grow up. When you've got yourself in your bubble, in your cell, and you can collect some people around you, form a bit of a sanctuary, mm. what I sometimes call a refugee camp, yeah. sadly to say, but that's what I've called it sometimes. And you can't go in there with new ideas. And they are supposed to be the alt. They're supposed mm -hmm. to be yeah. this emerging creative ground of this eternal improvisational but they have no reason to improve in quality. And the reason is they don't have a model for vertical development. Mm -hmm. Their model is difference and difference is horizontal difference, not vertical difference. And so there's no theory of maturity. Mm -hmm. What you've got is difference is the new icon and it's the new idol. Mm -hmm. And when you just do difference, who's going to judge you on quality? I'm just different than you. You see, you always have the extreme relativist, extreme mm -hmm. pluralist, 
rationale for why I don't need to, to compare or do anything vertical in levels of complexity and increasing of what might be called maturity. And those are some of the things I, I talk a lot about. And all development models talk about going from more immature to more mature. It's not a judgment. That's they, You need to be immature to go. It's like everything is needed. And so mm -hmm. we'll talk about integrative education would do that. It would have a model and a vision. Mm -hmm. Yes. I and mean, this phenomena you, you lay out, I often call it the Lone Ranger syndrome okay. in, in the alt world, the Lone Ranger, everyone off. Yeah off doing their own stuff with Tonto and, and off in the back of beyonds. And, yeah. and, and there is something very sexy about that. There's something very uh, enticing. Um, I think our Hollywood uh, uh, masters, uh, which, <laughs> which a lot of intelligence fingers in that world, you know, they've, they've learned that. And I can tell you a lot of, a lot of the opposition to certain um, political cliques in this country have been disarmed by films like Rambo, the Patriot, um, all, I mean, people have this archetype. I see it in certain political circles I run in and, and bump into, which I think may be a little bit different than yourself, Dr. Fisher. But I see that they these people have their head full of Neo in the Matrix. They think they're Neo in the Matrix and there's a pistol on the table and they're going to fight their way out. They have this fantasy. Uh, they're going to be Mel Gibson with 10 muskets over his shoulder running out with a hatchet or Rambo with a bazooka. And uh, this is, I, I think, there's very much weaponized archetypes that have been thrown back on us to defuse genuine opposition. So one argue and B is uh, a lot of those archetypes are pathological. Um, hmm. That's a pretty strong phase, but um, I'm not afraid to use that word. And one of the reasons I'm sort of basically my critique is, is that alt, the alt community, and this is a thesis, so it's not a propundation upon everybody's reality, but the alt community is no better at conflict than the mainstream is a, a better at conflict and or fear. Mm. In other words, how they manage conflict and how they manage fear equally not that great and quite immature. Mm -hmm. So that's my hypothesis. That's my research dedicated to that. I did my master's thesis on conflict management. I did my dissertation PhD on fear management. And uh, so I actually got degrees in the mainstream university on those mm. topics but for today i'm basically saying something like this i wrote down this morning is that the alt community lacks not only vision but it lacks a complex regenerative psychology mm. and uh, can it, you explain that some yeah so that's i'll get to the rebel with that and so the rebel would be an example of a more complex regenerative developmental psychology mm -hmm. and uh, you could also say it's a restorative psychology or even a rebel psychology in other words i find they have not included complex theory that the which has come into the culture you know through the sciences mainly but also through communications um, studies through physics and so on the sci art sciences but communications has been on to this, and now it's entering some of the more edgy stream of education theory. And we're going, complex theory is really important to understand how life works mm. and to be adaptive systems in complex systems when you have really complex, wicked problems like we have today, these huge crises that we're facing and young people are facing. I want them to have a really complex psychology, not only in theory, but in practices and practices of complexity. So complexity thinking would be the easy term, not just critical thinking anymore. It has mm. to be complexity thinking. Mm. And that includes learning how to work with chaos, order, new, old, regeneration. And so this idea of regenerative has come now. I work at an institute it was a PhD program, and it's called regenerative leadership. Mm. There's a whole subfield called regenerative leadership. And that's through studying how plants and things die and land goes dead mm. and how do you regenerate it and how does that apply not only to organic systems ecological systems but cultural systems and mm -hmm. we can learn from the organic world the natural world to how to do cultural management of cultural regeneration and mm. so on and that's called regenerative leadership well where are people getting that knowledge and they're, they do, they're not doing complexity and systems thinking so mm. the alt community is quite missing in that and that gives you vision you see of somewhere where are we going rather than i'm just different and i don't fit the norm 
But then there's also people who don't fit the norm and they're very different than you're different. So <laughs> we, it's really hard to pick out because you could just say, well, we're different. <laughs> you see, you don't, that's the problem with that word. It's become a nightmare. We're different. And it's just like, okay, so then what? Yes, yes. It's, for the um, collective, see, for the collective, right? For the, for the development, the evolution of the species, the evolution of consciousness, whatever you want to call it, the maturing of society, coming to a better restoration and a healthier, sustainable, sane world. Well, I think this is a, a result. What you're saying, this, this lack of vision and this lack of, of um, even some of these more complex ideas – this is very much as a result of that throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. And so you have a critique of the institutions of education, so-called, yep. and then you have this, this um, hard knee jerk reaction yeah. uh, of, you know, Hey teacher, leave the kids alone, you know, total skepticism about any um, authoritative knowledge claims um, or, you know, the, the horrible structures of education, throw that all out. Yep. And then what do you get? You get a community that, that has never heard of this, or they, they get things in dribs and drabs uh, in certain circles. I run in the right. There is an appreciation of, of how this system uses chaos uh, to its, to its effects. I mean, that's, that's uh, the Middle East for the past 20 years. That's what's going on. I believe in, in Ukraine as well, right? There are plans what's going to come out of this chaos. There's dribs and drabs that enter into these communities, but because they've, they've shut off academia um, and they've shut off uh, the professoriate. Um, they they have this ham-fisted understanding of even what's going on. Yeah, and and they, there's really no need. See, once you create your own difference, you've created no need for more difference. Yeah, <laughs> it's like once you've idolized difference, and it becomes the thing to be. Mm -hmm. uh, we're different because we're not the mainstream. Yeah, you can be pathologically not the mainstream. And you can be healthily not the mainstream. And you have no way to make that distinction if you just worship difference. Mm -hmm. Because you'll actually have common ground with the people who are healthy, with the un. Your common ground is, we're not part of the mainstream. Mm -hmm. well, that's true, you are. But so what? Yes, and I've There's seen that. no distinctions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I've seen that idolization, an excellent word right there, this idolization of difference in different communities I've worked with and personally, and then also in history. Okay. Uh, and, you know, for, for a good stretch of my adult life, I was involved in, in kind of a, a sect of Catholics, let's say that was somewhat estranged from yeah. the church proper. I've read about that, yeah. And at a certain point, this group the leaders of this group uh, were were interested in, in reconciling with the Vatican and and as was the Vatican. And what you ended up finding is that this community, which had existed, I'll say, 40 years by this point, you people grown up in this, it split. And, um, you know, some of them were warm to, to this reconciliation. And then some of them were addicted to going to church in hotel rooms and in people's basements and, okay. you know, having, you know, bishops show up and do confirmation in their backyard and things like that. And it, it, it is this stalling out and this, this, um, not this idolization, I think of difference. Yeah. So, and, and I've seen the same thing. You could you look at every civil war you want. The, the opposition group always splits at the end. Yeah. And then you've got just the whole ideas of, right. When you, the new revolution will just replace the old revolution uh, leaders with a different pathology. Um, they'll be different. <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 we'll still I, I, be oppressive, you know. Yeah, I mean that's the danger, and I think that probably fuels some of this um, that that rebel spirit, where it's, even the spirit it begins to hurt the community. And the reason the community exists before is, I think, it's that danger of um, you could say growing up or becoming part of the system is why you end up with that that split there. I think of of the Irish uh, War of Independence is a perfect example of that, both the idolization of difference and then also the fear and maybe the well-founded fear that once you become the the ruling structure, then you do sell out. And it, it, it's you know part of that that um yeah. drama so, of life. So I'm interested in a healthy rebel theory. I will get to it. I know uh, I'm just we gotta finish up fairly soon. So let me go through a couple more examples, concrete examples of our alt communities that I've seen implode more or less. Um, so I'm gonna go to one when I finished my PhD, 
um, I got a first contract. I just finished writing my PhD. It was on fearless leadership in and out of the fear matrix. Yes, take off on the matrix film. And fearless leadership. So that was the concentration. I kept asking the question, how are educators going to breed or produce? And is it a good thing or a bad thing to have fearless leaders, leadership? Anyway, I contacted a cold call to this company that was a consulting company in Minnesota. Uh, I'm up in Canada, and I saw this person who was doing a program called Fearless Leadership Training in organizations. So organizational development or cultural organization development, right? Big deal. It's a big field. It's a huge field. Consultants is doing that. And I thought, oh, maybe I could get in that field of organizational development, consulting. And so I said, well, I'm doing my dissertation on fearless leadership, and I see you have a program. And so this owner was very interested. They were sort of a really small company. And they hired me. I convinced them to hire me to do a survey of all the literature I could find across disciplines on the culture of fear. Anyone who's used that term, culture of fear, because that's what I was studying, um, that would be really interesting to see across disciplines. And then we'd have this report and then we could send it out to possible clients and inform them that this is a really important concept. It has universal application across many dimensions and disciplines. Mm. And we could be experts at this consulting company on helping them, you know, digest that information and make it useful for their organizations and growth and development. And so, that became very interesting. They paid me $3,000 American back then, which was damn good for me. And it was my first job <laughs> after my dissertation. I was broke. And I took it and I did this report. It took you know several months, six, seven months of just solid research, built this wonderful report. She edited it. And then, then about two months or it was two weeks before we were going to publish it. And I had done all the collecting of addresses for all these companies and we're working on the mainstream, but we're also on the edge. Like we're at the leading edge. Mm -hmm. Culture of fear had not been brought into a lot of discourses in the society yet. Although, as I say, some of the disciplines were picking up on it and using it. And it was the idea that fear is more than just a psychology. It becomes a culture. And what happens when that happens is not good. <laughs> um, all the pathologies of a culture of fear are pretty powerful. They pretty mm -hmm. much, any oppressive structure works on a culture of fear which is a cult kind of mentality, right? And closing off and oppressing people, scaring them. No mis mistrust is the basic foundation, hate, all those kind of things. Mm. Um, so anyway, here I'm ready to publish. I'm very excited. This is my new career. I'm starting. And this person phones me up and says, uh, we're not going to publish the report. And I just wow, couldn't okay. believe it. So I'm just, I'm sharing this with your audience because... Kids, young people as well, get ready for the world. If, if you're going to do something really edgy and cutting edge and really powerful, be prepared for the cut. John, I mm -hmm. know you're going through your mind of all the cuts that you've had <laughs> of people cutting funding and cutting this and cutting association with. And that's mm -hmm. what this person did. They cut association with me. And one of the reasons I argue is because I was just becoming more powerful. I was becoming more knowledgeable. And mm -hmm. I was saying, this is great. And it's not that they disagreed with the report. Mm -hmm. What I realized after, and they wouldn't, I couldn't get them to say it, is they don't want to put that out in the world and be associated with that report. I kept a copy of it. But <laughs> they would not associate with it because it challenged companies so much. The power of the, the data was there. You do not want to be building this. Here's how it's built. Here's the architecture mm -hmm. of a culture. You want to check that with your organization? Yeah, you do that. Because I can guarantee you most of you are running a culture of fear at the base of your organizations. Yes, and that dynamic is exactly at this hour of, of the college. What we're running up against is is uh, this this dynamic, and um, I, I certainly want to hear any any major points yeah. as as we bring things down and, and give you the stage for that. But this might be a good on ramp to something we had brought up before the show, and that is the dynamic of um, how do we account for how do we serve how do we um, bring bring our insights to the general public. And how do we incorporate that without selling the pass? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that is just an obligation as far as I'm concerned. It's a social responsibility to do so. 
Um, if I'm off doing leading edge marginal stuff, and this is the hero's journey, you come back with the gift at Ooh, the end of the excellent. journey. That's called the return cycle, right? After the differentiation and going off the hero, they come back to return the gift and be prepared for tons of rejection. And excellent. that's what hurts. And that's Ooh. what hurts. And that's why most of us don't want to come back and give the gift anymore. We just yeah. want to go off and do our own thing mm. and be very self-righteous that we are rebel rebelliously so correct and they are all wrong and they will pay for it, you know, <laughs> and so on and so on. But that's not, that's not a developmental cycle. That's not a healthy mm. cycle from a developmental point of view. That is just another dissociation. It's another pathology of, arrogance that you can go off and be your thing do your thing that is not how nature works that is not a healthy system mm. they you have to bring it back why because you were gifted by that culture to be so you return the gift that's like sacred mm. and so to me it's a sacred that we come and figure out how to bring our gifts to the mainstream and that's whether we do it in the you know the programs of tutoring and let's really think of it that way, not just as a function or, oh, that would be good this or a good money maker or it connects us with this. No, we, if we can really get attuned with that, no, we're bringing a gift. And I hear that you have that because you have that attitude with teachers. Mm. And I go, every time I hear you talk about teachers, I go, oh, yeah, you mm. have a sacred pact with what it means to be a teacher. You have a historical evidence for that. Mm how it's collapsed as a concept and a construct and you're attempting to restore the notion of teacher. That's huge. That's huge. And the teacher's going to sit, the teacher sits on going to the edge, but having to bring it back and, and teach it down to the people where they're at, the kids, mm -hmm. the others who aren't prepared for that level of knowledge. But that's what the teacher does. They're the mediator mm. of the old and the new of the extreme and the mainstream mm -hmm. teacher doesn't have to be just a radical educator. It, to me, it's radical to do good mediative teaching, to be a good mediator teacher. That's radical. And mm. that's why the word integrative is the correct word. Yes. It's integrating those differences, extremes, mm. rather than throwing the baby out with the bathwater and just trying to leave. Well, we'll go here, get on the ark. Get on yes. the arc of saviorness. It will be saved. No. And and with that that opposition from bringing back the gift, as you say, uh, you know it, it, that is a very dangerous. I, I see this personally. This this temptation, uh, and and just as as a larger community of alternative education, it's it's very dangerous. Once you run up against that opposition, you can become in in a negative sense fermented. You can become very sarcastic. Oh, yeah. And uh, and indeed arrogant yeah. uh, to yeah. that because you know uh, it, it it's a it could be a pathology it could be we could define it in different ways but it is this this sort of souring you come back so opt you come to people with this optimism and then to to get that pushback uh, it is a very dangerous period. Um, yeah. uh, Nobody likes to get hurt and rejected. Right. Yeah. Nobody. And, and there's very few people that know how to actually process rejection. Mm. A lot mm. of people know how to get mad. <laughs> yes. Yes. And some can get very creative and be mad. Mm. Yes. Yes. One of them's running for president in the United States. <laughs> and um, doing pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that, that would be a, a phenomenon too. I mean, if some of these, these uh, blind spots and these weaknesses, um, and not having that vision, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, that was the whole other discussion, but I think we're, we're running across uh, similar energies, at least maybe just on, the, on a macrocosm. Yeah, we really are. It's a good, such a good time to talk about the rebel energy right now with mm. what's U.S. election is just, you know, such a classic. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, one more really quick study, uh, PhD. So while I'm doing my PhD now, so the other story, um, I'm, I joined the center and it's, it's the off center. It's where the cool people hang out, the cool professors. And it's a center within the center, right? It's called curriculum studies and something. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. CSSI. Mm -hmm. and, and these were the cool people. And I was told, if you want to get into the university and the education faculty, those are the cool people to get on supervising your dissertation. 
And they were. They were the cool people. They were the ex hippies. They were, uh, the, you name it. They were very uh, up on the uh, very progressive chart, mm. above and beyond John Dewey, so called, but very contemporary. Yeah. But um, and I, I went there, and it was oh, this is like home for me, right? So I'm going to be protected as a graduate student in the whole faculty of the of the university, which is mm. very mainstream, very that I went to and I would find this protective center and, and, and the moral of the story is it turned into its own collapsing system of a refugee camp mm. for a lot of people that wanted to be protected while mm. they're doing their PhDs. Oh, wow. You created a hospital is what you did. Mm hmm. And guess who shows up at the hospital? A lot of really wounded people. Uh. And I was one of them. I was wounded by being the rebel I had been since 1983 when I left the whole system. Now I have to go back into the education faculty and system because I can't get a job. I'm out of money. I can at least get a student loan to try and build my career to go. You know, I'm on the edge of my despair yeah. mm -hmm. of this cycle. Mm -hmm. And I go there and I'm searching for the very same thing that I began to realize the, the professors there had 15 graduate students each. There was three or four professors. They were running with 15 graduate students. You can't do quality supervision of a graduate when you've got 15 nope. people. You nope. need to have two or three. That was the average in the university. Well, guess who found out? The dean of the faculty found out what was going on in the center. They sent out a survey, and I actually put down a lot of the information I saw. I says, this is just becoming a place where you, you can't talk about difference. Everything has protected. Love is the special word for everything. That was the key that got you in. And I'm yep. studying fear. And I'm studying fear. Yeah. And so they, after a while, I was like poo-pooed. And then once they found out that I had filled out this form, that supervisor, all those people, I by that time I had passed, but they don't want anything to do with me. Yep. They cut me right out completely. I was the bad guy that was gonna call them out. That mm -hmm. they were they were doing just what I think the worst of the pathologies of the homeschool alt movement does. We were doing it in a major university. And eventually a year later, the faculty what the faculty uh, dropped the whole center. Wow. Wow. Those people went back and did other jobs, but it's like it was gone. It was disbanded. Yes. And so this is the rebel when it starts to create the sanctuary. So let me give the rebel theory quickly, and then we can wrap up. Great. Thank you. Very inadequately, I will give the rebel theory. It starts with two. It's got two aspects. So first is the developmental level. The, the most important developmental psychologist and he's not officially a developmental psychologist he's really a theologian you may, may know him some of you may know him sam keen he's a well-established american author he did a theology you know graduate school work then he philosophy uh then he became a very popular writer um he wrote a book called stages of loving mm. And the stages of loving consists of five developmental stages that he considered. And he was considering that from a very broad base, very philosophical, very intuitive, very theological. And he says, this would be really good if humans had some kind of developmental model like this. I've never seen another one like it. It's just great. He did this in 1980. He wrote this book, Stages of Loving. And basically it was stage one is the child sense stage two is the rebel teenager adolescent stage three is the adult guess what we're only halfway through the developmental spectrum mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and i yeah. go i like that he was because the next stage was the outlaw ah okay and then the next stage was the lover mm. that's the developmental arc. That's the vision for human development. Mm -hmm. You don't stop at being an adult. When you stop at having adult as the top scale of development, here's the vertical, right? When, when we destroy the vertical, when you don't even show it because we don't see it, we don't know it, we don't have the models for it, 
oh, you're doing all this to get to be what, an adult? Mm -hmm. All the adults that I see are miserable. They're working at slave jobs. If you're actually as an adolescent really looking, and a lot of them are, they see, yeah, you're just like acting like slaves. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. So where do they go? Well, they regress. Mm. If you don't want to become an adult and grow up, because there's not a lot to look forward to, what are you going to do? You can, the cycle of development goes into retro. It goes retrograde. Oh, yes. And it cycles back to the stage before. And that's why a lot of adults act like teenagers. Mm. <laughs> and some of them will take what they can from the adult sector of development and society, but they live at an adolescent mentality. And some will go to child. And you regress right back under basically because you don't see a vision of going forward. Nobody's put the outlaw idea for you. And the outlaw is basically the parallel with the rebel. Mm -hmm. But it's at a higher stage of transcendent. It's transcended the adult stage, mm. not rejected it and thrown it out. It actually had a place to go and get legitimation at the outlaw level. And then wow. the, lo the lover is, that's like the sage or the saint, and you're moving up to very amazing people who mm -hmm. reach those very rarefied. And so I saw that and I went, oh, that so fits my idea. So I call it post-adult education. Wow. There actually is an education post-adult, and we ought to be teaching it and using that term. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's quite fascinating. So that for a fair amount of the population, you have this adult stage, which is unimpressive. The cap. And, sorry. The cap, you know, it becomes the yes, cap. Yes. And for some of them, um, the, the, they, that becomes the rebel, the more ideological ones. And then I'm just, I'm just palpitating this. Sure. So, so I may sure. be incorrect. And then for, I would imagine a, a great, a greater number, much greater number, they see the same, but that that uh, rejection of the adult becomes this juvenile. I would I would describe it as consumerist um, yeah. orientation. Is that fair? Like, it, yeah. It, you, yeah, you go back to impulsive. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. And wow. where is impulsive? Impulsive is in the child development. That's natural. Adolescents trying to work with managing their impulsivity <laughs> because you got to become an adult <laughs> and responsible, and you can't just pay attention to yourself. Mm. Those drives are still deep inside the psyche. This is the, the rebel psychology is they're still there. Mm. And you have to learn how to include them and transcend them. Mm -hmm. so, so someone like a Christ or these great leaders, the Martin Luther King and so on, those are the outlaws. Mm. And, and some of them, if they make it, you know, past assassination, um, you'll get to, you know, the higher levels of the teachers, the great teachers of, uh, throughout history in the east and the west and you can study those people too but the idea is it's lovely because the whole cycle is based on coming to love mm. yes what's the old highwayman song oh my god they shot him right and it's jesus and gandhi and uh, martin yeah. luther king and yeah <laughs> if, if you can get by the assassin's bullet from the uh, the bastard yeah. adults then you'll, you'll yeah, be all because right you're out, because you're outside of the norm and you threaten that norm adulthood right Mm -hmm. So if we had a concept that was actually called post-adult level development or post-adult psychology, and we mm. legitimized it within an institute mm. of learning, then it doesn't have to be this really radical, weird, you know, it doesn't have the exoticization. You just, it's just post-adult. Mm -hmm. And then you can even be post-post-adult. Well, we have post-modern and you have post-post-modern. Some people use those languages. And in, in a way, it sort of integrates it. You see, it's not trying to go to something completely different. Yes. And that's why I like the, that languaging. And it normalizes a quote in, I think, a, a good, but a much, much more mature, higher level of complexity. And so to live a life of an outlaw is basically, yeah, to be nonconformist, but you're not playing out all the retrograde adolescent uh, material and the impulsivities of it. Excellent. So the third last part of the rebel theory is my yes, own. Yes, sir. That was that Sam Keen. And my own is that I, I have basically this idea there are three, tra three kinds of rebels. Um, there's the essential rebel. And the essential rebel is the two-year-old who says, no, I will not put my coat on and conform with you people. 
and I have every right to that. Mm. And the, the beauty of the essential rebel is, is when they say no, if you observe carefully, they say no, and they say it very strong, like assertively, no problem with assertion, and they look at you in the eyes. Mm -hmm. You watch. That's the first time. But what comes back from the adult <laughs> or the sibling or whoever has more power is fire and stone mm. and brimstone. Mm -hmm. Do not ever raise your voice to me like that. Mm. And, and if then the child says, but why? Because I said so. It's the classic response of this very early development of when you become disempowered from your no. Mm. Yes. The central rebel doesn't lose it. The essential rebel is still in us. That's the spirit in us. At its best, that would be like a Jesus Christ, mm. essential, essential rebel. Jesus Christ would say no and looks at you and says, you got a problem with that? Well, I'm here to listen. I'm here to be with you, mm. to work through that problem that you have with me. I'm not going to throw you away. I'm not going to cast you away. Yeah, I may kick a table over once in a while because Jesus loses it too. But Jesus always looked. You look, you be there. Be there with your no. It's not mm. fuck you and then look the other way or don't even say anything and go the other way. And that's what happens to the two-year-old who can't be in the essential rebel. Yes, they, become yes. a twist, they become a twisted rebel. Mm -hmm. and, and the twisted rebel dresses up and puts the black on or whatever and the blood and the cut clothes and they act out the rebel constantly. The normal rebel is they dress and conform and conform but when you close the door and all the lights are off, they're stealing and doing other things because they're, mm. they're doing the rebel thing, but they do it, but I'm normal. So I call them closet rebels as well. <laughs> and so you can apply this to adults as well, who are the normal rebels. They, oh, he was such a nice guy, you know, he, at work. And yeah, and then when he got fired, he went and got a shotgun and came back. <laughs> yes. What's the normal rebel? Well, if you're if you're we'll keep it PG thirteen, but if you're in the Marian business, the, those are the women you go after, the ones that are buttoned up, because they'll they uh be be a bit feistier. <laughs> keep it PG thirteen, but anyhow, you bet. So that so, theory is basically you can see that I'm saying the rebel is essential. So uh, just to be clear, so you mentioned the two year old stage. Were yep. there two other stages? Um, the other two is the normal rebel. They're not really okay. stages. That's the number. Okay, number. Okay, more yeah. like sort of parts of a triad. Yeah. Central rebel, which is your core. Uh, the normal rebel is the one that accommodates to the world. Mm -hmm. still, still keeps the best of the essential rebel. The acting out rebel is more, you know, they're both pathological. If you're not the essential rebel, more or less they're pathological. Mm -hmm. It's just one is kind of normal and dresses nice, uh, the white collar crime. And the other one is dark and da -da -da crime. You know what I'm saying? It's like, there's still the, the reality is this rebel spirit will not go away and mm -hmm. you have to learn to understand it in yourself. That's why we, I said earlier, we need a complex rebel psychology theory, a models to work with. So mm -hmm. we understand ourselves better, especially in the alt community. That's why I'm teaching this. Yes, uh, yes. You know, I could teach it to the mainstream and they'd all listen. Oh. But Talk about rebels. Yeah, the alt community is going to listen to if you're talking about the rebels. Now, they mm. may not disagree. They may disagree. But you see, this is the language of the alt community. So today I'll summarize the rebel, a more complex theory. We need to bring in complexity theory to our languaging, our psychology, that core of the understanding the rebel and this new other developmental ideas like Sam Keynes is interesting. If you add that on, that's another mm -hmm. level of complexity. And then the other key word is integrative. See, when you're in developmental and looking at how complex systems work, they would help us understand what's going on with us in the alt community, rather mm. than thinking that we're weirdos and we're trying to defend we're not weirdos and you're the weirdo. You see what I'm saying? You just get caught in this really five-year-old psychology. Mm. They blame you for that, so you blame them for the same thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it's your fault. This is the more complexity of development. We can actually mature in the alt communities, I guess, mm. the summary. And there's actually lots of good knowledges. I've just given some pieces of bits today, and we can. everybody's going to have contributions. So thanks for having me on that, uh, John.
today. Absolutely. There's so much to think about there. And I'll certainly be chewing over this as we as we muck along here. Mm. Uh, and hopefully we can reprise these these very themes in the future, Dr. Fisher. So and, praxis, just to say praxis, yes, you sir. use that or you know, practices when you use theory to inform your practice, practices, yes. and then you take your practices and what you learn there, and then you check them up with the theory. And you keep yeah. that in a loop. Theory and practice, theory and practice, and that's called praxis. You gave a different different definition for praxis, I think, from a tradition the other day in one of your talks. Mm. Was it slightly different? But um, we can. That word is important, and that's if we just said the alt community. Yeah, we want to work with praxis. That's going to be one of our core things that we mm -hmm. do. Well, that means that you have to have theory, and you have to check your practices with your theory and that's your accountability mm -hmm. and the community of your others helps you check that up too. Mm -hmm. But we're operating. And then if the theory is not so good, you change it, you tweak it because practice seems to show this, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes theory can correct our practices too and say, well, you're really not following the theory there. Mm. See, we don't have anything to check us up. And that's where we've gotten ourselves in a bad loop. Absolutely. Very sure loop. Absolutely, because this is uh, what you see in homeschooling, for example, is, I mean, literally the most extreme example of that, where I know these people very well. <laughs> um, they're very critical about society, and yet the model of education that they have uh, chosen is exactly the model of education that has produced this society. They're just replicating mainstream school in their house, right. and, and and it's come a complete um, inability to see the connection between those those two points, um, praxis and doxis. Right. Okay. Yeah. Praxis and doxis. Yeah, that's what you're using. So those are related. And, and I, I didn't say what the, my definition of culture of fear was after I did yes. all that research because yes, it's very yes. relevant. Uh, when I came up with, with all that research, you know, for months and months on all across the disciplines, how to define the culture of fear, and I was grabbing pieces, and then I was to summarize it. My summarizing was a culture of fear is defined as a culture or a system could be an individual who is managing fear by creating more fear. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm rebelling against the system and I'm reproducing the same system. You see, it actually fit the definition of the culture of fear dynamic. And Perfect. this is, this is what we call a performative contradiction. Um, when we're the very thing we're doing is reproducing the very thing we think we're getting away from. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more fundamental to correct than that problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I have it. I, it's, it probably runs in my work. It probably runs in the Institute at some levels, but, but that's not bad. It's just, let's sniff it out. Anyway, thank you for today. <laughs> yes, this was fun. This was fun. So to the audience, please do check out the Fearology Center here at Apakasta Stacy's. There are so many great insights that Dr. Fisher and his guests have. And, and you can head over to Dr. Fisher's blog for his writings, his books, and uh, related materials. And then uh, the only thing I would plug uh, would be the parents' uh, ongoing education uh, program that we're rolling out for particularly for homeschoolers and for for tutors as well that we're going to bring you up to snuff with these different subjects that you might have difficulty with mathematics or languages and we're going to teach you some of this pedagogy stuff as well to be able to convey those those ideas properly to your children and then maybe we'll sneak in a bit of that praxis and we'll bring in these these points that dr fisher was bringing up so, Mikhail, thank you so much, especially for your uh, insights here, and I look forward to talking to you shortly. Yeah, very good. See ya.